Welcome back to Destructive Creativity. This episode, we are diving deep into electrolysis. And not just deep, we're going to explain on a molecular level and show you the hows and whys it works. Now, this isn't particularly a standalone episode because we did do an episode on electrolysis where we show you how it works, we demonstrate it, and the brief overview of what it is. So if you want to, go check out that and then come back here for a more in-depth explanation. My name is Jonathan Allers and this is Luke Wagner and he is the one that really has the credentials behind his name. So he knows how all this stuff works. So I'm going to pass it off to you and I'll run the camera for this episode. Take it away! So we're going to go a little more in depth into the video that Jonathan did last week as of recording this video. I'm going to do that by using a molecular model kit to kind of give a better visual picture of what's going on at an atomic level. So let's get into that. All right, so first off, we need to explain how this model will work. So obviously this is a water molecule. Red sphere is an oxygen atom, white sphere is a hydrogen atom, and this connection between the two is going to be representing a pair of electrons. So in a water molecule, one electron from an oxygen atom, one electron from a hydrogen pair up, and that is how they bond together. So with that, we can get into explaining how electrolysis works. So electrolysis works by taking electrons from one side, the positive terminal, and giving electrons to the other side, the negative terminal. So our process begins here on the positive end. Basically what we have is there are electrons being removed from this side, so what happens is we have two water molecules, have their hydrogens stripped off, like so, and four electrons get removed. So the oxygen, the two oxygen atoms from the water bond together, and it's supposed to be a double bond. Unfortunately, my model kit doesn't really work too well, so we'll have to use our imagination here. So we have two oxygen atoms with a double bond between them. I'm just going to attach that pair of electrons like this, but it should be in between the two oxygen atoms. So we've made our oxygen, that just bubbles out of solution. And we have our four hydrogen ions because they no longer have their electrons. And four electrons, represented here as these two pairs of electrons. So these four electrons move up the wire and into the positive terminal of the battery. Now, quick note on how this works is the four electrons from the water don't make it to the battery. They make it a little ways up the wire and then they knock out four electrons in the wire, further up the wire, and so on and so on and so on until it reaches the battery. So since the electrons just kind of get bumped up a little bit, at the exact same time this is happening over here, um, on the negative end, we have four electrons from our electrode come down to the four water molecules here. And each water molecule will have one hydrogen ion removed. And then these four hydrogen ions pick up the four electrons, like so, to make H2. Uh, two molecules of H2 gas. So our end products here, we have one oxygen molecule and two hydrogen molecules. So that is the correct ratio that we should be seeing. And these two just kind of bubble out of solution, so I'll move them to the side. So at this point, we now have a positive terminal surrounded by positive ions, and we have a negative terminal surrounded by these negative hydroxide ions. So that creates an electric field. The positively charged ions are going to move down the electric field, and the negatively charged ions are going to move up the electric field. So these four hydrogen ions, four hydroxide ions move together and join back together. 
and this forms water. And that completes our circuit. And this now explains why this process is inherently inefficient. You essentially need to provide the energy to split six water molecules, but you only actually succeed in splitting two of them. So as a sort of baseline efficiency, this process can only ever be about 33% efficient. Now that's not to say it's doomed to always be this inefficient. There might be some way to engineer a special electrode that can make use of the hydrogen and hydroxide ions in some way to improve efficiency, but as a sort of inherent process, it is quite inefficient, and this is why. Okay, so now let's take a look at what's going on when we do electrolysis when we have salt in the water, or sodium chloride at least, in the water. So in this case, we have the same kind of system going. So the negative um, terminal is going to be removing the hydrogen, or it'll be giving electrons to the water to create hydrogen gas. And over here at the positive terminal, we are removing electrons from something. So this here, this new molecule, this is sodium chloride. So I'm just going to say the uh, gray one will be our metal, so that's sodium, and green is our chlorine. So when you add sodium chloride to water, um, it, because sodium ions or sodium chloride is an ionic compound, ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, actually dissociate. So it doesn't remain as a piece of sodium chloride. It separates into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And hopefully I can kind of show this here. Each of these ions is going to be surrounded by six water molecules. So we're going to have one water molecule, sort of left, right, front, back, and then top and bottom. So imagine this last one goes under the table, and it kind of looks like that. Same kind of thing with the chloride ion. So, um, that's not super important for right now, but just recognize that the sodium and the chloride actually aren't connected in any way. Um, they're just both present. Um, that also kind of shows um, Jonathan mentioned, right, when you have a mixture of things in your solution, what loses electrons and what gains electrons basically depends on whichever one is easiest to either give electrons to or take electrons from. So at the positive terminal, we have a choice. We can either remove electrons from water or we can remove electrons from chloride. So this is a little bit of an oversimplification of why, but you can kind of imagine that in order to rip the electrons out of the water, you first need to pop off the hydrogens and then pop off the electrons. Whereas with a chloride, you just pop the electrons off straight away. So that's kind of a loose ex explanation of why the chloride gets its electrons removed rather than the uh, water. So we're going to do the same process as before. So over on our positive electrode, we have some water and some chlorine or chloride. So two electrons are going to be removed from two chloride ions. The chloride ions will join together to form chlorine gas, Cl2. We send two electrons up our wire. So two electrons come down our negative terminal. We pop two hydrogens off, and those two hydrogens pick up the two electrons to make hydrogen gas. So there's our chlorine and our hydrogen, and these bubble out. Again, we have a, a system over here. So uh, the sodium from the sodium chloride is kind of on the positive terminal. The hydroxide is produced at the negative terminal. And again, that creates an electric field. These two flow together and join together. Again, sodium hydroxide is an ionic compound, so it's not actually bound together like this, but I'm just going to connect them just for simplicity's sake. Now, what can happen in this system 
is after you do this electrolysis for a good long while, you start building up a lot of this sodium hydroxide, which makes our solution basic. In a basic solution, as we produce this chlorine gas over here, you're going to start getting uh, your sodium hydroxide kind of around this terminal as well. When that starts happening, I'll just to demonstrate this again. So you have your hydroxide and you have chlorine. When we have this, the following can start to happen. So the hydroxide will use its electrons to attach to one of the chlorine atoms, like so, and it'll rip it off of the chlorine molecule. So now we have a chloride ion and hypochlorous acid. So hypochlorous acid, of course, is an acid, which means it's going to react with more of our base in solution, the sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide is going to rip off this hydrogen to produce water. And at the end of it, we produce more sodium chloride and this here, sodium hypochlorite. And again, to reiterate, these, the sodium chloride and the sodium hypochlorite are not actually bound together, but I'm just sort of putting them together just so that they don't, you know, roll around and separate. So what happens when you electrolyze a salt solution is you produce sodium hypochlorite. This process um, has a special name. This is called the uh, the chloroalkali process, or the chloralkali process. And it is used industrially to produce most of the world's supply of sodium hypochlorite, which you probably recognize as bleach. So this process where you electrolyze salt water is how we get most of our bleach. So that's where this reaction is quite useful. An important thing I also want to point out is why do chemists study what I just showed you here? This is what I would describe as a chemical mechanism. We discuss how a reaction happens. And when you understand how a chemical reaction happens, in all of those steps I showed you, you may have noticed that the sodium ion actually didn't do anything. So all the sodium ion really does is it just acts as a positive ion to counteract the negative ions that are actually doing the whole process. And what that means is that you actually don't need the sodium ion at all. So you can use pretty much any positively charged ion that doesn't form an insoluble hydroxide. So potassium chloride works, calcium chloride works, I would wager magnesium chloride works for this process. Um, any of the group 1 elements work for this process except hydrogen. Um, yeah, and that's why we study chemical mechanisms, because now we know we can do this with sodium chloride, but maybe for some reason we have more potassium chloride lying around, and so we want to use that instead. Just like how the sodium ion, it didn't really do anything in our reaction, so we can replace it with whatever. In a similar way, we can replace any of the ions in solution as long as we replace it with a similar ion. So when we were originally planning this video, I wanted to go to the store and buy some sodium bromide, because bromide is almost identical to chloride in almost every way. And if we did electrolysis on a sodium bromide solution, we would make bromine. And bromine is one of the only two elements that is a liquid at room temperatures. And I thought that would be pretty cool. Bromine is a blood red liquid, and so we would make this liquid on our electro that would drip off and make our solution really scary looking. Unfortunately, in November 2020, the Canadian government banned the sale of sodium bromide, or at least it banned it for the purposes of using it in pools which is where I would have gone to buy the sodium bromide. As it turns out, sodium bromide is used in swimming pools and hot tubs to, in the same way that chlorine is used. So you add chlorine to a pool, it kills nasty things in the water that you know, form grime or might cause problems for your skin. 
in bromine based pools and spas, most systems have a little electrolysis box attached to the pool. So it takes in a little bit of the water, does electrolysis, and in the bromine system makes bromine that it puts into the pool and the bromine is what's killing right algae or other pests. The problem is just as I laid out. So when you have a pool, it's slightly basic. So there's sodium hydroxide lying around in the pool. You have the hydroxide, you put in the bromine, it makes the hypobromus or the hypobromite ion. And what happens when you do electrolysis on a solution containing hypobromite is you oxidize the, rather than oxidizing bromide into bromine, you can oxidize hypobromite into bromate, which actually causes cancer. So the Canadian government banned the use of electrolysis-based systems for bromine pools, which means that pool supply stores no longer sell sodium bromide, which is kind of ironic because, of course, I was going to buy sodium bromide to do electrolysis on it in order to show bromine, which is cool, but we can't do that because it might create bromate, which causes cancer. That's it for now. I'm going to do the outro this time because Jonathan told me to. <laughs> so thanks for watching. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. Uh, Jonathan or myself might try to respond to a few of them. No, we will respond to them. Thanks for watching. See you next time.